Today, we're gonna to be talking about cholesterol, heart health, and cholesterol lowering dietary measures that you can use today to improve your risk of heart disease and lower the risk that you're ever gonna have cardiovascular disease. We're gonna specifically talk about what cholesterol is and why it's important. We're gonna talk about how we measure cholesterol and what blood markers are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, the dietary patterns, ingredients, and specific functional ingredients that may lower cholesterol and build you a healthier lifestyle around lowering heart disease. And to save you the hassle of listening throughout the episode and listening to the entire podcast episode, I'm going to start with a summary of all my suggestions, right? Start off, number one, replace meat with plant-based proteins. Number two, try a portfolio diet. I'm going to explain what the reasoning is behind all these suggestions as we go along, and I'll talk to you a bit about what a portfolio diet is. Eat more plant fats, number three. And yes, I said more fat, and I'll talk to you specifically about why the type of fat is so important, and it's not just as simple as monounsaturated fats versus saturated fats. Eat more fruit and vegetables. One of the reasons, I mean, something that kind of goes without saying, but it, it is amazing what it can do for cardiovascular risk. Eat legumes, number five, and specifically 100 grams per day, which is a specific dose I know, but that's been shown in some large studies. Eat whole nuts and seeds, exactly 28 grams. You don't have to eat exactly 28 grams, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little bit why uh, and what that generally refers to. The specific functional fibers, number six, that I've uh, come across in some studies, including beta-glucan, psyllium, and some others. And I'll end off with my hot take on specific supplements, garlic, red yeast rice, and eggs, whether you should have them or whether you should not have them in your diet. All right, I'm not going to go into depth it, when it comes to the cholesterol processing in your body, how it's generated. There are some incredible podcasts and incredible source of information that I'll link to in the show notes. Pods from Dr. Peter Atia, for example, or Thomas Dayspring. Uh, there's Ronald Krauss. There's James O'Keefe, some incredible preventative cardiologists that I've done wonderful resources and created wonderful pods that go into depth about cholesterol processing. That's not the place for uh, this podcast today. And I just want to start off with cardiovascular disease actually encompassing a lot of different things. It's many different uh, heart conditions, including high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis that can occur in multiple different sites of the body, including the abdomen, your peripheries, your brain. There are many risk factors for these conditions, but we are specifically going to be talking and hopefully succinctly going to be talking about cholesterol and what you need to know about cholesterol. I, as a doctor, wish I had over an hour to talk to all my patients about cholesterol and cholesterol-lowering activities and specifically dietary uh, measures that you can take today. So hopefully, this is going to be a great resource for me. Plus, I'm getting asked by lots of colleagues and friends who are reaching an age whereby they're looking at cholesterol they might have been told that they've got high cholesterol they might have had a kid or are planning on starting a family and they want to be around for as long as possible and avoid the number one killer that we uh, uh afflicts us today particularly in the in the western world but also uh, gaining traction in different areas of the globe as well so we're going to start off with what is cholesterol Cholesterol is a waxy fat-like substance that is found in all cells of the body. It is so important, not a lot of people realize this, but it is produced endogenously, that is to say, in the body by all nucleated cells. We produce enough cholesterol to sustain life. The reason why we do that is because it's so important that without cholesterol, there is no life. It is the precursor to our hormones, estrogen and testosterone, for example, many other hormones. Uh, it has a major role in cell wall structure or cell integrity. It, it has a role in bile acids. Without cholesterol, there is no life. But there's also no reason to consume cholesterol endogenously, as we'll talk about in, in a little bit as well. When doctors and even scientists use the terms bad and good cholesterol, it's a misnomer. 
since there is only one type of cholesterol. There are not different types of cholesterol, but there are different cholesterol carriers. And the reason why you need cholesterol carriers is because cholesterol is insoluble in water. That is to say, it can't freely travel around the body to different sites where it's required. You need carriers. And these carriers are called lipoproteins. The ones you've probably heard of are LDLC and HDLC. That stands for low density lipoproteins and high density lipoproteins. On a standard lipid panel, so whether you go to a doctor in the NHS in the UK or America, your family physician, on a standard lipid panel, you'll tend to get LDLC, HDLC, total cholesterol, and triglycerides. Using those numbers, we can calculate a number of different ratios or estimations of other particles. And I do want to acknowledge at this point that there is controversy over the accuracy and the utility of a standard lipid panel. For example, LDLC, unless it's directly measured, which is very costly and it takes a while, tends to only be directly measured in specific laboratories or for research purposes. It's generally calculated using a formula. The most common formula that is used is one that was actually created back in 1972, something called the Friedwald equation. And it can be quite inaccurate at very high or le very low levels of cholesterol and very high and low levels of triglyceride. There are newer equations that give some degree of extra accuracy, but there is controversy over the accuracy of all these estimations. Those new equations have flaws and I've linked to an article from the American, American College of Cardiology in the show notes on the doctorskitchen.com if you want to read more about them. But let's just uh, appreciate the fact that LDL particle number is more accurate and there is something becoming more popular and more accurate than that, which is called apolipoprotein B, or also known as APOB. You're probably hearing this on podcasts that have been coming out over the last five, six years. APOB, to put it very simply, is a phospholipid that encompasses and engulfs all these atherogenic pro, uh, particles. Atherogenic particles are those particles specifically that can enter the arterial wall and start the process of inflammation with their cholesterol that they're carrying that leads to the downstream effect of atherosclerosis and blocked arteries that leads to strokes and heart attacks. These atherogenic particles include chylomicrons, IDLs, VODLs, and LDLs. These are different types of lipoproteins, and we don't need to know about them for the purpose of today's podcast. If you do want to know about them, there are many other podcasts that go into detail about what an IDL is, a VODL, where they're produced, etc., etc. But for the purposes of this podcast, we're not going to go into too much depth about those. Think of APOB as a tag for all these atherogenic particles or atherogenic lipoproteins. If you're interested in learning more about them, I'll link to them in the show notes. But let's just assume that the only panel that we are able to deal with today is a standard panel, i.e. one that has LDLC and total cholesterol. Most clinics in the NHS don't do more than that unless you're going specifically to a lipidology clinic whereby they have access to even more uh, wonderful tests that use NM NMR technology and all the, all the other stuff. As per European society guidelines, you can use LDLC to estimate your risk of cardiovascular disease. The information conferred by apoprotein, apolipoprotein B or APOB, as I'm going to say from now on, uh, is similar to that of calculated LDLC. So we're going to use that as a proxy, but I do acknowledge that it is not as accurate as uh, some of the newer markers that are less readily available. Okay. With that in mind, uh, and I'll put a, I'll link to a table with all the sort of calculations between milligrams and deciliter per deciliter, which is what you tend to get in the States, and millimoles per liter, which is ten, tends to be what we use in, the, in Europe and the UK. Uh, there are differences between them. So I'm going to try and remind myself to use percentage reductions rather than uh, actual amounts and where I do I'll, I'll give a, a caveat and um, uh, a, a quick sort of um, calculation 
the aim of the game of trying to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease is to try and reduce LDLC as much as possible. Because as we age, it goes up and there is clear consensus and evidence to suggest that not only is there a relationship between this increase in LDLC and high risk of cardiovascular disease, but there's also specifically a causal relationship, i.e. LDLC or more accurately APOB containing lipoproteins are causally related to atherosclerosis. So it's not just correlation, it is causation as well. The reason why we know this is beyond mechanistic studies, beyond observational studies. There are also genetic studies, ones that are called Mendelian randomization or use a Mendelian randomization technique to decipher whether there is a causal relationship. Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but for the premise of this podcast, we just need to agree that high LDLC and high total cholesterol and high amounts of APOB is causally related to uh, cardiovascular disease. The aim of the game is to try and reduce it. And so all the advice that I'm going to give you today is going to be related, is going to be uh, within that context. I just want to quickly explain why I'm of the opinion that APOB containing lipoproteins or LDLC are causally related. And there is mechanistic evidence, et cetera, et cetera. But the reason why is because if you're increasing the number of APOB containing lipoproteins or LDLC in circulation, you're increasing the chances that these particles that are carrying cholesterol can lodge into the arterial wall at many different sites and start the inflammatory process of atherosclerosis where cholesterol that they carry can become oxidized. There are some people that say, well, as long as you don't have high amounts of systemic inflammation, it doesn't matter. I think that whatever happens as we age, the inflammatory process is always going to be an upward curve. So you want to lower the chances of you having that inflammatory process starting by lowering the number of particles in circulation. Remember, this isn't to say that cholesterol is inherently bad. Like I've said at the top of this pod, it is a very, very important molecule on our body, but the dose of cholesterol and where we find cholesterol and limiting the the chances of you putting that cholesterol in the wrong places is of utmost importance and that needs to be balanced. And the certain calories of cholesterol, namely LDLC and OPOB, need to be reduced in circulation. And that's why you see that the causal and the observational effect that we've said. The reason why most people have high cholesterol is because of a defect in something called the LDL receptor, which reduces the rate of LDL removal from circulation. That's the main reason why we see raised LDLC uh, levels. There are some dietary things that are going to that can uh, change that, but mostly gene defects are the reason uh, for why we see high amounts of cholesterol in, in, in the blood as well. There are some dietary factors, but just be in the knowledge that dietary factors can have somewhat of an effect, but in many cases, people need to take um, pharmaceuticals to lower cholesterol significantly if needed be. The point of this podcast is to give you dietary and lifestyle measures to mitigate the amount that you might need of those pharmaceuticals or try and avoid them altogether as well if we can. So the gene defect doesn't necessarily mean you've got something called FH, which is called, uh, which is standing for familial hypercholesterolemia. There are many different variations of high cholesterol that are signaled by, uh, by, by are caused by different gene defects. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've got FH, which is quite a significant condition. That's pretty much all I'm going to say about the biochemistry of cholesterol. We're going to talk about strategy now. So People, I want to say this actually as a just a, a PS to what I've just mentioned. I want to get a fact clear from the start. There is a lot of confusion around this subject. People respond to dietary cholesterol differently. That's because of uh, our variations in our genes that affect how much we absorb of cholesterol that we consume, how we process them in the intestine and throughout the rest of the body. There are genetic differences between us that impact how we absorb cholesterol from fats and from uh, food. But in general, with a few exceptions for people with this genetic abnormality that increases the amount of cholesterol that they can absorb from food, the cholesterol we eat does not significantly raise the cholesterol we see in our blood. 
essentially the contribution of food to blood cholesterol is minimal. Dietary uh, cholesterol is largely esterified. That means it's, it's in a particular format that is not absorbable and it's largely excreted instead of absorbed. However, and this is where it gets complicated, so I'm going to be very mindful about the words I choose here. Cholesterol-containing ingredients that are exclusively from animal-based products are not exclusively cholesterol. It's not when you eat an egg or you have a piece of steak that you're consuming pure cholesterol uh, or nutrients for that matter in isolation. We eat these foods and they have a collection of different nutrients. They've got different types of fats. They've got proteins. They've got different molecules in, which is why this area is very, very complicated. To add more controversy, according to the European Society of uh, Cardiology, trans fats and saturated fats have the greatest effect on LDLC levels i.e raising them and the reason why they do that many reasons why but they down regulate the ldl receptors that take ldl out of circulation thus increasing the amount of ldlc in circulation in the blood the ingredients that tend to have more of these types of fat trans fats and saturated fats in the composition are red meat processed meat pastries fried snacks and cakes and that sort of thing which is why they tend to get a bad rap but again using the same thinking that i apply to cholesterol containing foods you can't blame all saturated fat containing foods and all trans fat even trans fats uh, either because there are many different types of fats that we find in ingredients and even research on full fat dairy products that you would imagine are saturated fats purely uh, like full fat dairy products like cheeses um, yogurts suggest that it can actually be protective and that may actually be due to specific types of saturated fats that they consume, uh, that they uh, that they contain things like stearic acid and palmitic acid, specific carbon chain lengths around carbon chain length 18, um, and even certain types of trans fats, conjugated linoleic acid, for example, uh, that you find naturally in dairy products. So, even when we isolate uh, specific types of saturated fats, the way we talk about them seems to group them all into one category. But in 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 when, when you actually look at them there's variations of saturated fats uh variations of specific types of polyunsaturated un, and monounsaturated fats and also variations in the different types of ingredients that contain cholesterol as well so i mean that might explain why some recent meta-analyses have found that dairy products have a neutral or maybe even a protective effect on cardiovascular disease you probably getting an idea as to why this is such a complicated uh, topic as well. Again, I'll link to those meta-analyses in the show notes on the doctorskitchen.com. I'm a firm believer for this reason that we need to focus on ingredients rather than the specific uh, uh, blanket or blanket statements around uh, saturated fat, carbs, protein, cholesterol. And it's also the other thing to recognize is that it's a zero sum game when it comes to removing something. It's not like you just remove something and that's it. There's a big gaping hole. You tend to uh, always replace it with something else. And with that in mind, we're going to dive into some of my suggestions for lowering cholesterol and thus your risk of cardiovascular disease. Let's start off with number one, plant protein. So published in the Journal of American Heart Association, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials looking at replacing animal protein for plant protein so things like soy and pulses and nuts and they suggested that one to two servings of plant protein in substitution for animal protein decreases ldlc and apoprotein apolipoprotein b by around four percent which is a meaningful amount and in the authors in this particular study stated that it may have a clinic, clinically meaningful benefit in helping people to achieve lipid targets and reduce cardiovascular risk. Probably because of the distrib a positive distribution of the different types of fats that those uh, two categories of ingredients contain. So where meats might contain a little bit more saturated fat, 
plants still contain some saturated fat but in a lower amount compared to other polyunsaturated fats and maybe the types of fats also differ there as well they also contain fiber which we're going to talk about a bit later which can explain potentially that cholesterol lowering effect this is not to say that you can never eat meat but if you're being aggressive about trying to lower your cholesterol by any means necessary or trying to improve the efficacy of pharmaceuticals that you might already be on we'll get onto that a little bit later replacing your animal-based products with plant-based proteins is a strategy that i would advise and monitor with repeated blood tests over the time period that you're making that dietary change we're going to talk a bit more about fiber and the constitution of those plant-based proteins as uh, uh, and provide some mechanistic reasons as to why we might be finding that as well. Okay, so point number one, replace meat for plant-based proteins. And if you can't replace all meat, then certainly inch toward replacing your animal-based products with plant-based proteins, being mindful of the protein amounts that you're replacing as well. I've done some pods on uh, plant-based proteins and how to... Uh, match those for meats and what it tends to come down to is making sure you've got a variety of different plant-based proteins in your diet and increasing the amount that you consume as well because plant-based proteins tend to have less protein per 100 grams and you also need to get a variety of them to make sure that you are protein replete because they have uh, different ratios of amino acids and you tend to have to combine lots of different plant-based proteins to get the full nine essential amino acids. Number two, portfolio diet. So a portfolio diet is something that I wish I learned at, uh, about during med school because a dietary portfolio is a plant-based dietary pattern that was um, studied in the early 2000s and it has a portfolio of four cholesterol-lowering foods and nutrients. These are specifically plant protein, viscous fiber, nuts, and phytosterols. It's low in saturated fats, as it's largely plant-based. And those four components were 50 grams of plant-based protein. They were, ten, tends to be taken from soy or dietary pulses, for example, beans, chickpeas, legumes, that sort of thing. 20 grams of viscous soluble fiber from oats, barley, psyllium, eggplant, okra, certain fruits. We'll talk a bit about um, soluble fibers and the reason why that might have a cholesterol-lowering effect as well. 45 grams of nuts, things like tree nuts and peanuts, and two grams of phytosterols. I'll talk about where you get those two grams of phytosterols from as well. You can get them from many different types of foods. You can get them from uh, vegetables and whole grains. It's hard to get two grams per day unless you're actually eating like me, for example, and you're getting loads of different types of phytosterols in your diet. So they initially, in these studies, included enriched spreads. They tend to get these margarines uh, or different types of oils where they, they bang in some phytosterols into them. In a controlled feeding study, two grams of phytosterols initially displaced cholesterol as, as much as 25%. So these phytosterols are pretty powerful things. If we're looking at different types of ingredients, the highest uh, phytosterol containing ingredients are pistachios that have 271 milligrams per 100 gram serving. Uh, you also got flaxseed, 210 milligrams per 100 gram serving. There's also uh, a wheat germ, uh, which has 197 milligrams per uh, one half cup. Early findings from these metabolically controlled randomized controlled trials, which are quite uh, unusual to do and quite hard to do, is the reason why they're unusual, showed that LDLC was lowered by the portfolio diet similar to that of 20 milligrams of lovastatin, which is a type of statin medication that we use. And that those literal amounts were uh, around 30%. So lowering your LDSC by 30%, which is pretty, pretty, pretty high. Um, 46 healthy hyperlipidemic adults were used in this particular study. So those are adults with high LDLC levels. They had a four-week intervention with three different arms. There was a control arm where they were put on a low saturated fat or low fat diet, essentially according to the current guidelines at the time. The statin group, which was on the low fat diet, plus the lovastatin, the 20 milligram statin uh, pharmaceutical that they used. And the intervention arm, which was the portfolio diet, which is the 
diet high in plant steroids and the soy protein and all the rest of it. Um, and that was shown to have the same lo lipid lowering effect as a statin, which is pr pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and then another systematic review and meta-analysis, again, of metabolic controlled and other trials that didn't control exactly what they ate, they showed, so the real world studies, they showed that the portfolio diet significantly reduced LDLC by around 17% um, among several other risk factors for cardiovascular disease, including apoprotein, apolipoprotein B and C-reactive protein. So pretty impressive results from these, these other studies. Um, the issue with these studies is that because they're relatively short, it's very hard to prove that just because a diet or any intervention for that matter lower, lowers LDLC that that actually converts into protection against death and cardiovascular disease. But in another study where they looked at the portfolio diet in action, uh, it was the Women's Health Initiative study from 1993 to 2017. They looked at a over 120,000 postmenopausal women um, who remember have high risk of cardiovascular disease as well. In this prospective cohort, higher adherence to the portfolio diet was associated with a reduction in incidence of cardiovascular and coronary events, as well as heart failure. So again, lots of flaws in how we collect this data and this nutrition information. We have to use things like food frequency questionnaires, but all these little pieces of information coupled together, you know, you've got randomized controlled trials, you have very rigorous metabolically controlled trials that are isocaloric, so you don't have the confounding issue of lowering your energy intake. Um, I think as a preventative measure, particularly if you have cardiovascular disease in your family, a portfolio diet is definitely something to try. I have looked at other um, dietary patterns, Mediterranean diet, for example, DASH diets, um, and they do report similar reductions in cholesterol. But I like the rigor of the portfolio diet. I think it's um, uh, something that is very attainable and certainly encompasses a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking to you about today. So number two, try a portfolio diet. Number three, plant fats. Now, dietary strategies that both lower LDLC and raise LDLC should have broad application when it comes to cardiovascular disease. We haven't really talked much, that much about HDL and the role of that, but uh, without going into too much depth, the higher your HDL, the better. That isn't a uh, something that works when we pharmacologically try and raise HDL, but generally we want to see a higher HDLC number on your lipid panel. Your ratio of triglyceride to HDL is also something that can be calculated on a fasting lipid panel as well. Um, you simply divide triglyceride, also known as TG, by HDL, and you want to have uh, a ratio that's closest to one as possible. Anything higher than that, you have an elevated risk of uh, heart attack and stroke. And one method of increasing your HDL cholesterol appears to be the use of monounsaturated fatty acids, which is key in something like the Mediterranean diet, for example. They have lots of nuts and olive oil, and that, and specifically if it replaces carbohydrates in the diet as well, uh, or the proportion of carbohydrates, not completely, um, this is where it appears to have a beneficial effect. Now, all the fat enthusiasts are going to come, start coming my way now, waving the high fat flags. I'm not saying that you should be eating a full, uh, a, a purely fat based diet, but certainly increasing the amount of these specific types of fats seems like it could be beneficial. So much so that a fifth component to the portfolio diet was added in response to some of these studies, which now includes when you go on a portfolio diet, uh, uh, as well as those four things that I mentioned earlier, they do include uh, plant based monounsaturated fatty acids in the form of olive oil canola oil, high oleic acid, sunflower oils, or avocados around 4, 45 grams per day. And they've used sterile containing margarines as well, but there are other ways to naturally include phytosterols uh, and plant fats in the diet as well. Looking at, at the studies that, um, uh, that they examined this in, published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 2010, 
adding monounsaturated fatty acids to a dietary portfolio of cholesterol-lowering foods and hypercholesterolemia. They substituted 13% of total calories as carbohydrates with monounsaturated fatty acids. So they removed around 15% of your carbs and added uh, fats instead. Um, uh, in 24 participants in over eight weeks, they provided all their meals. So this is a very well-controlled study. They gave all those different types of monounsaturated fatty acids. And in both the portfolio and the portfolio plus fat diets, they had a, a similar reduction in LDLC, but in the fat diet, they had a raise in the HDLC that they correlated with a better cardiovascular protective effect. So the potential of these cholesterol-lowering diets to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease is pretty good um, and definitely something that I would uh, highly encourage people and other practitioners to think about as well whenever we're advising uh, our patients. Um, they also uh, talked about replacing animal fats with other types of fats that are richer in polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fatty acids to reduce LDLC as well. Um, the reason why is because these types of fats appear to upregulate the LDL receptor, which if you remember from the mechanism earlier on, is a way in which we can remove LDLC from circulation and thus lower cardiovascular risk. Just to call myself out there, like I don't uh, like how these academic papers always have to refer to polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids without really making it more practical for clinicians and scientists to converse with patients and the general public using the medium of ingredients because that's literally how we eat in reality you know when you are having olive oil you're not just having poofers and moofers you're also having some saturated fats you're also having vitamin e you've got a whole plethora of different micronutrients con uh, contained within that uh, ingredient so a better statement in my uh, opinion is choose plant fats where possible and try and replace your carbohydrates with plant fats by around 10 to 15 percent and remember these are isocaloric substitutions so without changing your energy consumption that ldlc lowering effect appears to be uh, preserved and the hdlc raising effect of plant fats so that's my third point try and eat more plant fats from good quality extra virgin olive oil a side note on sunflower oils and corn oil and all that kind of stuff i personally don't like the taste of them um of the uh, sunflower oils and corn oil i think the extraction methods of these oils can also disrupt the quality of them as well there is a uh, a movement towards these high omega-6 oils being neutral or maybe even cardioprotective I'm just always going to go with extra virgin olive oil from a flavor point of view. Uh, but I think there is probably more nuance to that discussion that is currently being led on. And for now, as a pragmatic approach, I'm always going to go for extra virgin olive oil or small amounts of um, other types of oil as well, like avocado oil, although that is quite a lot more expensive. Fruit and veg kind of goes without saying, like I said, but each seven grams a day higher intake of total fiber is associated with a 9% lower risk of cardiovascular uh, disease. A 10 grams of uh, high fiber intake was associated with a 16% lower risk of stroke and a 6% lower risk of type 2 diabetes as well. According to the European Society of Cardiology, um, high fiber intake that we've talked to about before might reduce your postprandial so after eating glucose responses so the blood sugar in your um your your sugar level in your blood um particularly after carbohydrate rich meals as well and like i said it kind of goes without saying increasing fruit and vegetables is clearly related to huge reductions in cardiovascular disease there are so many different types of the studies it would be pretty futile for me to go through all of them um, but one in particular from the journal of nutrition titled fruit and vegetable consumption and risk of coronary heart disease and meta-analysis of cohort studies they looked at nine eligible studies for inclusion in this meta-analysis around 90,000 men 130,000 women and 5,000 coronary heart disease events <clears throat> and the risk of cardiovascular disease was decreased by four percent for each additional portion of fruit and vegetables per day and seven percent reduction for fruit intake as well which might point towards the soluble fiber content or specific types of fibers that you find in fruit namely like 
pectins and fructans, um, which are very healthy. I know there's a, another movement that is kind of anti fruit, but actually fruit is um, fantastic when it comes to cardiovascular protective properties. The reasons why fruit and vegetables might be protective, well, you've got things like potassium, folate, vitamins, fiber, phenolic compounds, reducing antioxidant stress, improving those lipoprotein profiles, lowering blood pressure, increasing insulin sensitivity, improving clotting regulation. The list kind of goes on with increasing fruit and vegetables, but it's lovely to know that there is that increase, uh, in, improved cardiovascular protective effect for just every portion of fruit and vegetable or fruit per day. And I've said this before, but we need to be aiming for 10 portions of fruit and vegetables per day rather than the arbitrary five a day. And remember, a portion is 80 grams. I'm not too sure how to convert that into cups for the Americans, but 80 grams is what you want to be going for for every fruit and vegetable that you consume. Population studies you know, have many limitations when it comes to food frequency questionnaires. So it's quite hard to ascertain the causality of these, but I think there is plenty of evidence to suggest the mechanism which makes it pretty plausible that increasing fruit and vegetable consumption is going to be related to um, uh, cardiovascular benefits. Again, limitations include the healthy user effect. If you're going to be consuming more fruit and vegetables, you're more likely to exercise more, go to the gym more, exercise in general. Um, you're probably going to be more educated. You might have a higher income household. These are all things that are quite hard to tease out of these big, big studies. And as nutrition is a zero sum game, you're generally going to be displacing meat and junk food when you increase fruit and vegetables and you put down your plate. So point four, eat more fruits and vegetables if you want to lower your cholesterol. Let's turn our attention to some more specific ingredients in addition to the ones that we listed in the portfolio diet. So plant-based proteins, monounsaturated fatty acids, plant fats, all that kind of stuff. Beans, legumes, lentils, chickpea, all that kind of stuff I think deserves its own section. First of all, we'll talk about some big studies. So published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. There was a study called Consumption of Nuts and Legumes and the Risk of Ischemic Heart Disease, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. They reviewed 27 studies that included over half a million subjects and showed that consumption of just 100 grams of legumes, so that includes everything I just mentioned, chickpeas, lentils, all that kind of stuff, four times a week, so not even daily, was associated with 14% lower risk of ischemic heart disease. Now, those kind of studies suffer from the same limitations that I just described, healthy user bias, food frequency questionnaires, all the rest of it. But still, that shows us some signal. And why might that be the case as well? We have to think about that too. Um, these authors were so impressed by the results that they think of recommending beans in addition to statin therapy to improve health outcomes and lower the potentially lower the prescribed dose of statins as well, which is really, really encouraging. But let's talk about why beans and these other sort of um, fiber rich ingredients might have these potential benefits. Well, they contain multiple different things beyond just fiber that can improve cardiometabolic health and contains things like uh, folates, phytochemicals, the fact that they have different types of fiber that can lower glucose spikes that we just talked about in the previous episode on the Doctor's Kitchen podcast a few episodes back. It lowers LDLC as published in the British Journal of Nutrition, a number of different uh, meta-analyses as well. Um, it can replace different foods. So if you're going to be having more beans and legumes in your diet, remember nutrition is a zero-sum game. So if you're going to be adding more beans, what are you replacing? You're probably going to be replacing things like uh, saturated fat, rich animal-based uh, products. At a chemical level, fibers have varying amounts of both insoluble and soluble fibers. Th those two sort of big classifications of fiber tend to dominate uh, the thinking whenever anyone talks about them. In reality, there are hundreds of different types of fibers, but let's just think about it quite um, simply. More l Legumes tend to have more insoluble to soluble fibers as a ratio compared to fruits and grains they still do have some soluble fibers in them and remember what those soluble fiber benefits are so 
in order for it to be uh, a soluble fiber, it has to be resistant to hydrolysis by small intestine enzymes. So basically resistant to the breakdown of um, uh, uh, into smaller parts by the enzymes that you find up further up in the digestive tract in the stomach, for example. But it's fermented into what's called short chain fatty acids lower down in the digestive tract in the large intestine. And these short chain fatty acids, we've talked about them before, things like acetate, propionate, butyrate. These short chain fatty acids leads to different uh, and changes in the intestinal microbiota, which contributes to the hypocholesterolemic effect. Um, the reason why modulating the gut microbiota, and just to uh, uh, explain again, the gut microbiota refers to all microbes that you find in the digestive tract, but largely concentrated in the large intestine. The reason why modulating this population has a beneficial and potentially therapeutic effect when it comes to reducing LDLC and, and lower risks of things like EPOB as well is because the, the, there is microbial conversion of cholesterol into something called coprostanol, which is a different type of sterol, which reduces the ultimate absorption of cholesterol into the bloodstream, which now, which then gets packaged into LDLC. So overall, it can have an LDLC lowering effect. Microbes also trap cholesterol for removal via the digestive tract. They metabolize cholesterol into bile acids for excretion. So there are a number of reasons why improving the population of those microbes in your large intestine can have this high PO, i.e. low cholesterolemic effect in the body. Adding insoluble fiber also adds bulk to the diet, which absorbs and sequesters cholesterol, again, which removes its, um, uh, for, which leads to excretion uh, into, uh, into the feces. So again, it emphasizes the point that we don't need exogenous cholesterol to function. There is no need for us to consume excessive amounts of cholesterol. We produce enough. And with all those different above effects, you, you can explain why uh, beans and legumes and all this kind of, uh, these kind of ingredients are so healthful from a, from a cardiovascular standpoint. When you look at it from the, the micro level, you can understand those LDLC benefits after just a few weeks. But again, the same question is, okay, well, it lowers LDLC. Does that actually translate into a macro cardiovascular benefit? And yes, you see those macro benefits. When you look at large observational studies of people who have high amounts of beans in the diet, it definitely correlates with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So the take home here is adding dietary fiber can be used as a dietary strategy, strategy to lower LDLC, even complement statins as well. Um, and hopefully even, you know, if somebody has to go on a statin, of which many people do, if you can go on a lower dose, you potentially lower the side effect profile, the tolerability of the drug, um, and you potentially even lower LDLC before a drug is even required. So my take home here, eat legumes, 100 grams a day is a minimum. There may be even more benefits beyond that as well. Next point, nuts in particular, plant-based fats from nuts and extra virgin olive oil, but nuts in particular. So these tend to have a higher ratio of monounsaturated fatty acids and polyunsaturated fatty acids. They also have saturated fats as well. Let's not forget all fats contain different amounts of all these different types and, and various, various subtypes of those types as well. But when you consume nuts, uh, they lower post Prandial, so after eating glucose uh, spikes as well, they improve your insulin response. So again, that can have a beneficial cardiometabolic effect. I'll do another podcast purely on sugar, I think, and the potential of sugar to uh, increase cholesterol. But we have mentioned it on a previous podcast recently as well. Nuts and plant-based uh, fats are also rich sources of things like magnesium that can have antiarrhythmic effects as well. Um, and despite the, um, the consumption of nuts uh, leading to more calories and more energy, which is always a bit of a concern, particularly when I talk to patients about having more nuts, they, they always come back, particularly the older generation of 
you know, well, I thought nuts were high in calories, so they're not good for me. And unfortunately, it's one of those sort of dietary dogmas that never fails to sort of um, die. Um, and whilst an overall balance of energy is important, when you get into the weeds of actually the quality of foods, that is what trumps everything else. So, you know, if you're eating whole nuts and whole seeds, you do not need to worry about the calorie density. And in fact, calorie dense nuts consumption has been associated with less adiposity, adiposity, fancy word for obesity in observational studies as well, and does not contribute to weight gain in trials either. So the amount of energy that you're actually absorbing from these whole foods is probably going to be lower, um, and it doesn't appear to have that obesogenic effect either. So the benefits of nuts, are, you even find the benefits of nuts that have been shown in the you know seminal PREDIMED trial. Uh, it provides compelling evidence that nut consumption is cardioprotective, which is why they've added plant fats to the portfolio diet, which is why the Mediterranean diet is actually quite rich in fats from plant-based sources. And the the question is, okay, well, how much? Um, so again, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, consumption of nuts and legumes and the risk of ischemic heart disease, they reviewed 27 studies, including those half a million unique individuals I've already mentioned the study earlier above, and 28 grams specifically, I don't know why they put 28 grams specifically, uh, a 28 gram serving of nuts was associated with 24% lower risk of ischemic heart disease, uh, a 22% lower risk of non-fatal ischemic heart disease, and a lower risk of type 2 diabetes as well, just four times weekly. So my suggestion is have a hand, that's about a handful, handful of nuts every single day, can, ha can have a LDLC lowering effect as shown in the portfolio diet and coupled with these big observation studies that show a kind of protective effect, I think is definitely something that's prudent to add. So eat whole nuts and go for around 30 grams a day. Who knows, even more I think could, could be beneficial as well, but there aren't massive studies to demonstrate that um, either. Let's talk about oats. There's a lot of oat bashing going on these days. Uh, and I think it comes down to the dose of oats that we consume rather than oats being a bad addition to one's diet. Um, in this particular study that I'm going to talk about, they only use 70 grams of oats per serving, which is a relatively small amount. In fact, that's the amount that we tend to use whenever we do recipes on the app, the Doctor's Kitchen app that you can get from the App Store, uh, hopefully coming on Android soon. But in this uh, short-term perspective open-labeled uh, trial, uh, which is randomized, um, there were it was in a subject of Asian uh, uh, patients as well, uh, which are you know who, who are more at risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, Eighty patients, mildly high uh, hypercholesterolemic, so fancy word for high LDLC and total cholesterol. And they were randomized into two different groups. One had their normal diet and the other group had their diet with 70 grams of oats twice daily. That is uh, equating to around three grams of beta-glucan, which is a specific uh, functional fiber that we'll talk about in a second. The group who had oats twice a day, so around 140 grams, but over the course of a day rather than one big setting, uh, they found that there was an LDLC reduction of 10%. It's very small compared to the other things, but it's I think it's a it's a very small study. Uh, it's a significant impact, but a very small study. But I think this is a good one to have for the Asian population in general. And the interesting thing about this study is that it wasn't necessarily in the form of oats. It was also in the form of upma, which is a thick porridge uh, with seasoning and vegetables. And it's actually quite delicious as well. I tend to have no oats with other things as well, things like nuts and seeds and full fat uh, milk or coconut milk or whatever it might be. So if you're having oats on its own, you, you don't really have much of a food matrix. If you're having it with other types of fats as well, I think it's going to have that beneficial impact and lower the uh, potential risk of a high glucose spike. Some people don't do well with oats and that's fine. I think we have to be respectful of that. But a lot of people would do great with oats. Um, and certainly if it's replacing what tends to be a highly refined carbohydrate rich uh, meal in the mornings um, so and you can also have savory oats as well and the way I eat it with hemp seeds pumpkin seeds uh, other types of plant-based fats is probably a healthier way 
of consuming them too. Uh, so my, my recommendation is try oats, 70 grams twice a day or you know, 80 grams, 75 grams in the morning uh, could be a good way to introduce beta-glucans. Uh, let's specifically talk about beta-glucan because it's referred to as a functional fiber, which is a specific fiber that is extracted or isolated or synthesized and shows benefits to health. So other examples include fructans, gums, lignins. Uh, you've probably heard of polyols or psyllium. Um, and prebiotics are a specific class of functional fiber that are unique in that they selectively stimulate the activity or growth of beneficial, I say that in, in quotes, uh, health-promoting bacteria. In reality, I think all bacteria serve a purpose. It really just comes down to the dose um, of, of that particular microbe. But these prebiotics are a specific class of, of functional fiber, and they generally promote the growth of things like lactobacilli, bifidobacteria, uh, and thereby improving the host's uh, health. These particular fiber ingredients, like I mentioned before, should be resistant to the digestive enzymes that you find higher up in the tract and should not be absorbed in the higher in, uh, higher up in the tract. And they should uh, reach the area where they can be fermented by the gut uh, microbiota into metabolites and things like short chain fatty acids as well. Psyllium husk is a type of uh, functional fiber, a prebiotic. And in this uh, recent meta-analysis of three, just three, I, I take that on board, three randomized controlled trials, they revealed that the addition of this, uh, what, what psyllium works, uh, as you might have heard from a previous podcast I did on glucose spikes by forming a, 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 a gel viscous uh, uh, substance. Uh, and the reason why it slows uh, it, it prevents glucose spikes is because it slows the absorption of sugar, glucose, into the bloodstream. Um, and what they found from this dietary gel-forming viscous soluble fiber is that it doubled the eff efficacy of statin. So if you're trying to reduce the dose of a statin, uh, then having some psyllium husk actually might uh, be worth a shot as well. Again, I would do that with the, uh, with the advice of your practitioner uh, we've already talked about the mechanism for why soluble fibers can improve LDLC and total cholesterol and all the rest of it. So I won't repeat it here, but it is definitely something that I would think about. Um, psyllium husk is something I might be taking myself. Specifically, there are different types of beta-glucans. Um, one we already talked about in oats. You also find it in barley and actually in small studies published in the British Journal of Nutrition. Uh, they actually uh, inject, or they they, they gave uh, a small uh, subject, of, a population of people, just 30 people with mildly elevated LDLC, some uh, breakfast uh, beta glucan derived from barley, uh, and they they had them on a controlled uh, diet for lunch and dinner. Um, so in the breakfast in the breakfast they gave them this beta glucans, and they found that uh, the mechanism responsible for the LDLC lowering effect that they observed. It's probably because of uh, these fibers stimulating the production of bile acids that then reduce the absorption of cholesterol and remove cholesterol through the digestive system. So these are studies that all to say that I'm quite bullish on the idea of functional fibers. And maybe there's even a product to be created whereby you have adequate amounts of all these different functional fibers in some sort of uh, shake or um, a supplement or whatever it might be uh, to potentially reduce the dose required for statins or avoid them uh, completely, um, which is uh, which would be a fantastic thing. So eat fiber and try functional fibers is definitely my uh, take home for that. I'm going to do some hot takes on a few... Um, on a few ingredients that I've definitely been asked about before, garlic. Uh, this is something I get asked about a lot as a GP. I think there's definitely rumors or uh, old wives' tales about garlic. Uh, for some reason, people take them in supplement form, uh, in oil form, and uh, there isn't great evidence for it. Uh, I, I, the best that I found was a meta-analysis published in 2013 so there might be some newer ones that are more impressive i'm not too sure uh but this one looked at 39 and this wasn't a very good 
uh, study as well. So th 39 trials uh, involved 2,000 participants. Sounds really impressive, but when you dig into it, they included a range of different interventions in this meta-analysis. And the reason why you do a meta-analysis is because you want to pull lots of hopefully similarly and well-conducted studies into one big, big study to ascertain the overall effect of whatever intervention it is. In this case, it's garlic. But they used a range of interventions uh, from garlic powder, garlic extract, garlic oil. I don't know why they did that. I don't know why they just didn't stick with one form. And then they also had a range of interventions from a dose perspective as well. So some powders were 600 to 5,000 milligrams per day. Oil was 9 to 18 milligrams per day. Um, raw garlic, 4 to 10 grams a day. And if anyone knows uh, a bit about garlic, you know, if you uh, crush garlic and leave it for 10 minutes, you increase the uh, amount of the phytochemical allicin in it. So the method of extraction, the method of preparation is going to have a significant effect on the phytochemical profile of the intervention that you're using in this case garlic so that that should have really been thought of i think in the analysis and you know the good things are that in most of the trials people had high cholesterol they all came off lipid lowering medication at least four weeks before the intervention but the the reductions in LDLC in terms of cholesterol were modest at best, uh, as per the author's um, uh, uh, conclusion. So, I can't tell you whether garlic is good or bad. If you want to experiment with it, I would do an N of one experiment, i.e., you take garlic for at least uh, eight weeks in whatever form you find. I can't. I couldn't even tell you a, a starting range. To start off with with garlic because they're just there's so much heterogeneity in the interventions out there in these studies maybe that's why they had to use those poor quality studies because there weren't very good well well um conducted studies out there um and then monitor the effect on your ldlc or OPO, apob if you can afford to get an opob test uh, after that eight weeks of whatever that intervention is and then figure it out but otherwise I would save your money for real foods. I, I wouldn't really um, advise garlic. Oh, garlic is fantastic. Don't be wrong. It's a prebiotic. It adds flavor to food and all the rest of it. But when it comes to supplemental form, I'm not bullish on that. However, I am bullish on red yeast rice extract, which is uh, a cholesterol-lowering nutraceutical. Now, I've definitely heard of red yeast rice. I've definitely seen it in like health food stores and places like that. Uh, but I never really knew how interesting it was. And, and this is my hot take on it. It's basically a statin. Um, it's obtained in a natural way. So through the fermentation of rice, um, the red coloration is because of the fermentation process. So it, it, it pigments the, um, the, the product. Uh, but the effect of it is mainly due to a, 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 a chemical called monocalin K, uh, which is a weak reversible inhibitor of 3-hydroxy-3-methyl-glutaryl coenzyme A reductase. It basically works in the same way as a statin. Um, published in the Journal of Atherosclerosis, so a, a, a good journal, they analyzed 20 randomized trials on over 6,000 patients, and the LDL lowering effect of this uh, nutraceutical um, compared to placebo was pretty pretty large it reduced it by around one millimole per liter uh, of ldlc which is which is big um that corresponds to a, a cardiovas cardiovascular risk reduction of 15 to 20 percent so it's as efficacious as a statin but the the benefits of this were that the incidence of kidney injury and uh, liver abnormalities was less than five percent um it has a statin-like mechanism of action, like I've just described, but it seems to have lower side effects. So the risk of myalgia, which is a common side effect with statins, which is basically uh, muscle fatigue and soreness, and uh, it can be quite debilitating for a lot of people. In fact, I've taken people off statins and tried a different type of lipid-lowering medication many times in the past because of the side effects. Uh, so it could... It could be 
an option for people who have that. I never really considered it myself, uh, uh, recommending red yeast rice. Um, it could be a therapeutic tool to support cholesterol lowering uh, lifestyles as well, who, or, and, and obviously those who can't be uh, treated with statins. Um, and it appears there is a purified form of this as well. If you didn't want to take the, the fermented product, monocalin K, five to 10 milligrams, that appears to be the sweet spot. Um, the safety, unfortunately, of red yeast rice is scanty at best. Uh, the reason why is because some commercial supplements are tainted with high levels of a toxin called citronine. Uh, so commercial products don't tend to have the same rigor of safety profiling as pharmaceuticals in that they can be... Um, they, they cannot have any of the constituents that they say on the label at all, and they just don't have that uh, independent verification process. So that is something that makes me a little bit worried about this particular nutraceutical. But, you know, if you can find a good form, the evidence suggests that it could be eff efficacious. So, you know, I, it's one of those things that I was surprised to find positive studies on. And it could be a, it could be something that people use, particularly if they're intolerant to statins for whatever reason that they have side effects as well. Okay, I'm going to close with eggs. Oh, the bane of my life. I'm asked about eggs all the time. Is it good for you? Is it bad for you? I really wish it was easy for me to say that eggs are fine. Eat as many as you want. They're completely innocuous. Cholesterol and eggs doesn't matter at all. Or don't eat eggs. They're really bad for you. They're going to give you heart disease. There's clear evidence to suggest that. In reality, it's a bit of both and it's nuanced and it depends on your biology, your unique genetics and the rest of your lifestyle as well. So first of all, let's talk about what eggs are. Eggs are a brilliant source of nutrients. They are full of protein, they contain micronutrients like lutein and zeaxanthin that's important for brain health and eye health, uh, not to mention B vitamins and choline. They have specific types of fatty acids that are fantastic for your brain, like omega-3, vitamin D. Overall, if you look at the profile of eggs, it's a fantastic whole food that has been eaten for millennia. I eat them myself and I recommend other people eat them as well. The uncomfortable truth, however, is that consumption of more than two eggs per day is associated with and will raise your total cholesterol and LDLC as well. That is a fact. And unfortunately, that is an uncomfortable truth that even though I would love to have a cognitive bias, a cognitive dissonance away from it, when you look at the studies, it's quite hard to argue against that. But like any food that has saturated fat, like meat products, for example, or cholesterol, I always turn to Paracelsus. And that is to say, all things are poison and nothing is without poison. The dosage alone makes it so a thing is not a poison. That is to say, the poison is in the dose. The amount of eggs we consume coupled with the quality of the rest of our diet is an important factor in determining whether you choose to eat eggs or not. It is completely your choice. Plus, an individual's response to dietary cholesterol, just like we said at the top of this podcast, and saturated fat is highly variable. Depending on your genetics, depending on your microbiota, you might be one of those people that who can eat three, four, or five eggs and not have any impact on your LDLC or total cholesterol levels or, AP or APOB levels at all. Very, very lucky if you are. It can have no impact on those levels. Or on the other hand, you could be one of those very susceptible people who can have a sniff of those foods and have an impact on their APOB levels and their LDLC levels as well, thus increasing your cardiovascular risk. As we've determined, LDLC raised levels will confer. Published in the, in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology in 2015, dietary cholesterol has modest effects to increase total C and LDLC levels on average. So this is what people always say when they're trying to protect against their precious cholesterol-containing foods. However, in the same journal, they admit and they, they say that there are hypo and hyper responders in the population. And unfortunately, at present, there is no widely available 
or inexpensive method for clinical use to predict who is likely to experience a change in atherogenic cholesterol or not. Basically, there's going to be an effect in some people, but there's no way for us to tell you whether you're going to be susceptible or not. You basically have to experiment yourself. There are also some people that say that no matter what their LDLC cholesterol level is, as I mentioned before, you know, I, I, as long as my inflammation is low, it doesn't really matter what my LDLC level is. Or there are also people that will say, well, it raises my LDLC cholesterol level, but it also raises, raises my HDLC cholesterol level. And it does in some studies actually demonstrate that. And so overall, that mitigates the effect of those atherogenic particles in circulation, having a low carb diet with eggs, improves your insulin sensitivity so i don't need to worry about it i think that's potentially dangerous and i'd prefer to play the numbers and actually reduce ldlc because it is causally related to the development of atherosclerosis everything is about trade-offs so for the convenience of a nutrient dense food how and delicious food how willing are you to have a slight raise in your cholesterol levels an average of an egg a day is unlikely to have, just one egg a day is unlikely to have a significant or clinically meaningful impact on your LDLC levels as per European Society of Cardiology Guidelines and American uh, Lipid Guidelines as well that will reference on the podcast show notes. However, if you already have high cholesterol levels, A per B, LDLC, total cholesterol, and you've optimized other areas of your diet, I think it would be a reasonable suggestion to remove eggs from your diet and monitor your bloods and see what impact that has. And if you are a hyper responder to, to cholesterol and fats in your diet, particularly from saturated fats, again, it's something that I would consider removing from your diet. As much as I love eggs and as much as I love consuming eggs, that is the, the fact. And, and instead of removing the fat from your diet, I'd replace those eggs with plant-based fats. As we've discussed, plant-based fats have a beneficial impact on your LDLC and OPB levels. This is a really controversial subject and it's definitely nuanced. Having some eggs in your diet doesn't automatically make it bad. It doesn't automatically make it good because of all those, you know, the profile of eggs that I've just talked about uh, a second ago. And this is where a lot of people, including myself, and I like to call myself out here, are practicing that cognitive dissonance because we don't like to appreciate the uncomfortable truth of the fact that eggs have this cholesterol raising effect. Um, but overall, you know, your diet isn't determined by a single ingredient. I'd be wary of the cholesterol raising effect of eggs. I would start off by having no more than one egg a day. And if you are not uh, a responder to cholesterol in your diet, you can have as many eggs as you like in your, in your diet. But that depends on you doing your individual experimentation as to whether your LDRC and APOB levels go up when you consume eggs or not. And if you are trying to aggressively lower your LDLC level, which is what this podcast is all about, then I would remove eggs from your diet as much as it pains me to say that. Um, and it's hard to find a a nutrient dense food of the same magnitude as an egg that is convenient and in the whole form but the facts are the facts I'm, I'm afraid to say to myself probiotics are another one that get a lot of attention uh i've been asked about probiotics and the effect of uh, cholesterol lowering effects um, i think we've got a long way to go the only things that i've come across are mouse studies animal studies that aren't particularly useful because how something reacts in a mouse or an animal uh, does not necessarily mean it's going to have uh, any effect in humans actually um, in a mouse study a probiotic combination of vsl3 which is commercially available it has lactobacilli bifidobacteria and streptococcus larvarius and thermophilus and all these different strains uh, that was found to improve lipid profiles in mice in humans Again, very limited studies. A double-blinded placebo-controlled uh, study involving just over 100 subjects with high cholesterol levels. The same uh, uh, group reported a, dec a decrease in the LDLC levels by around 9% uh, after consuming the probiotic in the form of a yogurt. I think it's very, very early days for probiotics. I think I'm bullish on the mechanism of it having a cholesterol-lowering effect because of what we know about fiber, 
the impact on modulating your microbiota and the hypocholesterolemic effect of that as well. But when it comes to cholesterol lowering effects of probiotics, these supplements don't tend to have great evidence for now. Not to say that you shouldn't have probiotics in your diet in the form of yogurts, kefirs, krauts, kimchi, uh, but when it specifically comes to whether I can recommend this as an LDLC lowering uh, ingredient, I can't really say that uh, for now. So, you know, in conclusion, if I had a patient or you're my patient, and I'm trying to lower your LDLC cholesterol levels, which is, you know, what I think would be a pragmatic thing to do, uh, given that the rates of cardiovascular disease and the causal effect of, of cholesterol uh, in, in cardiovascular disease, what would I tell you to do? If you were a perfect patient and I was trying to aggressively and perfectly manage your diet, lifestyle alone and all the other stuff that we need to do as well but just your diet this is what i would do i'd put you on a portfolio diet which has those four cholesterol uh, cholesterol lowering foods plus plant fats it would be supplemented with plant-based proteins i would put you on an exclusively plant-based diet which had plant-based proteins ensuring that you were protein replete which is something that can be quite hard to do exclusively in a whole food plant-based diet i would add good quality fats from extra virgin olive oil uh, and avocado as well as good quality uh extra virgin uh, 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 good quality nuts and seeds i'd potentially even add supplements in the form of phytosterols that we discussed earlier beta glucans psyllium and flax as well there is some evidence around spirulina having a hypocholesterolemic effect as well. So you could even get a green supplement with my prescription, my dietary prescription. And maybe if I could find a good source of red yeast rice, maybe that is something I would add as well, just because of the, um, the impact, the mechanism, the fact that it has statin-like effects with potentially lower side effect profile. Um, remember all these things are great and you know that that is a hypothetical situation where i am uniquely positioned to give you the prescription and you are 100 percent compliant with it but it's not just about the knowledge of all these different foods it's really about the implementation it's something that i always go on about the science is complex as you've just heard the solutions are simple, the inter implementation, that's the hard stuff. That's the really, really hard thing to do, which is why our focus is on doing the recipes for the app, doing the recipes in the cookbooks and making it easy and giving you practical tips like I've just gone through today to make it easier for you to implement on a daily basis. So I really hope you found this useful. We're going to be doing an infographic on all these different tips uh, in the newsletter. So make sure you sign up to the Eat, Listen, Read newsletter. Sign up for the app. The Android is definitely going to be coming soon. If you want to join the waitlist, there is a waitlist on the newsletter and on the website, thedoctorskitchen.com. And if you want to look at the references, of which there are going to be many for this podcast, make sure you check out thedoctorskitchen.com as well. And I'll see you here next time.